Greetings and welcome to Outlaw Gamer Radio, the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com. This is the show where we live to play and play to live. I'm Brent Adams, joined by a man who is also spending 30% less time doing something he used to do constantly, but that's mostly because of marriage and carpal tunnel syndrome, Mr. Lauren Baumgarten! Lauren! What, Brent? What? What do you want me to say? I didn't say anything, buddy. I just said that you're doing 30% less of it. I mean, <laughs> it's not like, I mean, it's not a bad thing, I'm sure. 30, 30% less or 30% more of something else? Well, that's true. I mean, you know, sometimes in marriage, sometimes it doesn't always go the direction you expect. But uh, anyway... Enough about my domestic life. <laughs> yes, you th- son of a. Thankfully I'm so. I'm kidding. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great, man. Uh, it's been a it's been a great week. It's been a fun week. It's been an exciting day. If you are in any way interested in science, NASA, astronomy, and the fact that NASA has discovered uh, evidence of flowing liquid water on Mars, bitches, Mars. That's pretty exciting news. I, I, I got to tell you, that was... More, more exciting than the Pope in the United States? Yeah, yeah. Because it's all Pope all the time where I am. Yeah, quite, quite a bit more for me. Um, not being of the, of the faith-based or religious uh, persuasion. So yeah, I was, I was very, very excited about the, uh, about the NASA stuff, though. As I imagined... A day, a day after the, the supermoon. Yeah, which I didn't get to see because it was completely overcast here all night long. Uh, I got to see. Was, I got to see a really, impressive. really bright spot in the fucking clouds. Is what I got to see. But the pictures look it, nice. I'll just have to wait for twenty thirty three. The world's not going to end uh, before then, right? Uh, right. I, well, can't say for sure. Yeah. Um. You know, I just want to say something here at the top of the show about the Outlaw Gamer community. We love you guys. You know that we love you guys. We say often, "Hey, we love you guys." But we do, um, and we mean it. But there, there's one person, I'm not, I'm not going to mention names, I'm not going to embarrass you, I'm not even going to go into any details, but I just, you know what you did, Lauren and I know what you did, and we just want to say thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you, guys are, you guys are awesome. I, I mean, you really, really are. Lauren and I, uh, Lauren and I often talk about how, how we just can't get over um, how fortunate we are to be a part of this uh, this community that we've all spent so many years building together. Thank you all very very much for being a part of it. <laughs> that, that that is the most nebulous. You're gonna have, the entire audience is gonna be like, "What the fuck are they talking about?" Well, th- there's a re- there's a reason I'm not saying, but anyway. Also, at the top of the show, Brent, I want to mention I could have done this in my in my end of the sunset, but I got something else to talk about. Okay. Uh, one of our uh, we I, we have several developers in the uh, in the audience. Yes. And uh, one of our developers, Patch, returned to the website and uh, threw up his logo for his his team called emitter games it's a pretty dope logo and i just wanted to give them a shout out awesome uh for those of you that work on games i expect you to keep us in the loop as to what's going on with the games that you are making that's right um and if you have right, to you be, want to talk- if you have to be making games over at io interactive we want you to know that we're not angry at you for delaying hitman to 2016, which is the first story. I'm, I'm certainly not angry. In the garage, uh, of course, the uh, the Hitman. I guess it's kind of a reboot since there's no subtitle to it. It's just Hitman, but it's the latest Hitman game. Uh, originally going to come out in December, has now been slated for a March 2016 for the quote initial release end quote, which of course relates to the fact they talk about this Hitman game being an ongoing experience that they're going to be adding content to over the course of next year. Uh, they say, quote, these extra few months will, will mean we can add more to the launch content of the game, more than we originally had planned, and then follow with a tighter frequency of updates, which ultimately will create a better game for everyone, so says IO Interactive on their official website. Uh, the initial release will have a, quote, good chunk of the game, and then... Whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. Yes. I, I gotta stop you there. Yes, yeah, so you want to talk about the I- initial release? <laughs> Uh, the, it, it literally says Hitman for, will first ship with a, quote, good chunk of the game. Which IO Interactive plans to add to over the course of the weeks and months with new locations and additional content. It says that it will detail the full release schedule and scope of Hitman soon, which I would really like to know about. Because uh, on the one hand, I appreciate the fact that they're telling us that what you're getting up front is not the entire experience. As opposed to just letting us buy the game and find out the hard way. So, so I appreciate that. <laughs> But I thought, the, what I want to know is, 
Do I only have to pay the one sixty dollars in order to get everything? Get that's the rest of it, and I highly doubt that. I, I'm very concerned, Brent, by the fact that you, you are not. It, we've now gotten to the point where they don't even try and bullshit anymore <laughs> and say like, no, no, every you're getting the whole game. Like now they're just like you're, you're not. You're not getting the whole game. You're getting a good chunk of it. It's, this is like you're, you're getting a good chunk of it, not the whole game, but a good chunk. Like. And that doesn't seem to phase you at all. This is like a conversation. Like if this were a conversation between Bernie Madoff and Kevin Bacon, it would go something like, look, you remember like all those retirement plans that you had? Just go ahead and give me your money. Go ahead and give it to me. Give it to me now. It's disturbing to me that, you know, it's, well, okay, it's here, disturbing the- to me that like they're comfortable enough with to, to use that language. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to judge them. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to prejudge them. Okay. <laughs> You'll judge them later. If, if it's because here's the thing, it could be like the walking dead, you know, or something from telltale where it's like you pay this price and then we release episodes. And then you get more content. Yeah. That time. would be fair. It, it could be, Do you really think that's going to be what it is? I don't know, but that's what I'm saying. Okay. I'm not going to prejudge. I'm going to wait and find out what the details are before and then judge I decide them. I get it. whether to kick them in the balls. I get it. I get it. Assuming they have balls. I don't know. They got a lot of balls to say that. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> and it's a hit. Softball. Uh, moving <laughs> now, on. speaking of balls, Brent. Uh, yeah, speaking uh, speaking of balls. There's actually there's actually no correlation here, except that uh, I appreciate the the cojones on the group that's doing this. So yeah, uh, there's a you've seen this, I'm sure this week because it. I mean, it, it made all the rounds. But um, uh, there's a uh, there's a virtual tour of the Enterprise D. This is uh, the Enterprise made famous by Star Trek: The Next Generation that uh, has has been created. And uh, or it created in Unreal Engine Four, and which everyone is very very quick to point out is also Oculus Rift ready. Ha ha ha! And uh, there's about a 12 minute video on YouTube letting you uh, letting you walk around. I don't think they've actually made they haven't made the actual like simulation itself available. Now that I've said it out loud, I'm almost positive I'm wrong. Uh, just because I said it anyway. Uh, <laughs> not owing to any actual knowledge on my part, but uh, I'm just kind of like talking around the fact that I don't know what else you say about this other than if you watch Star Trek, the next generation, and, and if you are a Trekkie or, or Trekker as the case may be, um, this is really fucking cool. Actually. I mean, like it's remarkable to kind of like, you know, walk through these environments and be like, Oh yeah, I remember this or, Hey, you know, that's an episode where that, glowy thing appeared in the corner and tried to suck them all into another dimension you know like that kind of stuff it's it's fucking absolutely cool. and i so it, it's doubly amazing if you are a fan of star trek or have have ever been a fan of star trek i happen to be of all the the uh, um star trek you know universes that i have been most drawn to the next generation uh, was the one i was most drawn to which is what this is a rendition of the enterprise 1701d yeah um, it was Picard's um, Enterprise, but and it is amazing, just as you said, to encounter that. But even if you're not necessarily a fan of Star Trek, or maybe Next Generation wasn't your favorite one, it's still really amazing to look at because you start to think about some of the stuff that that we're going to get into in VR, like mm-hmm. uh, creating the ships from Aliens, creating the interiors of the ships from Star Wars, and at this point, and at some point, this will wear thin. But I'm not sure when it will be. But it ain't today. But even just even just walking around these iconic vessels uh, is incredible. Is absolutely incredible. It's and this neat. is going to be it's damn neat. I mean, any of the iconic. I mean, it's just so many things people are going to get in there and render the being in the helicopters in the scene from Apocalypse Now, or you know, for you know the Titanic, or I, you know, I mean, I don't know. Like yeah. so many things. I, I I think that that's actually something that I, I, I mean, I'm just I'm going to. I'm going to try to be a futurist here for just a second. I think that that's something that you're talking about right there that, that may actually become kind of a big deal, like re- recreating sort of like famous, in this case, a famous setting from a television series. But at what point do people start sort of filling in content from that? It's like, okay, so you can sort of be like a nameless crew member on the enterprise and they've actually filled in the ship with NPCs and characters. But then it gets to the point where they are recreating episodes from the show complete with you know models of all the main actors and the actions that they're doing you know like they're on the bridge and you know like they're walking over here and discussing how they're going to solve the problem and then back to the captain's chair and hail the ship and tell them x y and And you can kind of sit there and observe the 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 episode of star trek the next generation play out 
and you can just kind of walk around inside it and see it happening. You know, I mean, yep. I, I think that that's something people are going to get into. Another thing that I was thinking about in this virtual tour, I, the ship is empty. Like, like you're just, you know, first person. It's view. totally empty, and it's a work in progress right now. I think if you go to their their Patreon page, they've built two two decks, and they have forty more to go. But you know, you go and you're you're, you're looking around, you're seeing, um, you're seeing, you know, just like this empty ship. But I was thinking, okay, like number one, you know, they'll they'll get to the point where they'll they'll have the entire ship created they'll like the entire Absolutely. deck of the enterprise eventually they'll have the all, all of the versions that's exactly of it right. you know, then somebody will go back and they'll do the original uh the original enterprise from right the, they'll the do all the ships series, from deep space nine and from the right, movies yeah. blah 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 uh and the thing that i was thinking about is well what what could you do with that once you had it and i mean you think about things like like a shared virtual reality experience i mean like you know a bunch of people get together they have their avatars dressed in Starfleet uniform. I'm sure you know they'll have like you know like fucking character backstory and stuff like that. But that's <laughs> like it would just be like a virtual hangout. Like, like so. Wait hey, a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are you talking about? Are you talking about V LARPing? Yeah, basically that's what I'm talking about. So it's. <laughs> well, no, so I mean, it's, but no, it wouldn't necessarily have to be that. Like it wouldn't even. It wouldn't even have to be role playing. It'd just be like. That that would be a chat room in virtual reality. No, absolutely. I'm just kidding. It just just this idea of people dressing up in cosplay in virtual reality, having gone back from essentially going back from r- real life cosplay into virtual cosplay. But yeah, no, you're right, 100. percent Like, It'll absolutely, happen. that could be a, a a shared space. And that, I mean, it's uh, you guys just got to go see it. It's awesome. And and we're on the cusp in the next six months of of. Uh, VR coming out, and God knows this will probably turn into a VR cast. So, uh, <laughs> like it hasn't already. Stop lying. <laughs> um, all right, Brent. So, uh, last up in the garage, we have speaking of properties like Star Trek and Star Wars, we yeah. have an official date for the Star Wars Battlefront beta. Yeah, which is soon. Um, very soon. Uh, coming October eighth. It'll be October eighth through the twelfth mm-hmm. on uh, PC, Xbox One, and PS4. All three systems getting the beta. It's open to the general public. Uh, the game comes out November 17th. In the beta, you will get to experience three modes, it says, spread across three of the planets, uh, including the Walker Assault on Hoth, Drop Zone on Sullust, and Survival Mission on Tatooine, which is a uh, uh, single-player or co-op uh, mission where you're fighting off waves coming at you. And so you, it sounds like you're going to get a, a pretty decent cross-section, and this is, uh, of course, really meant to be a stress test for them, but I, I feel like they're they're putting out... a uh, not an insignificant amount of content, which which I don't know. To me, says good things, not bad. If anything at all, yeah, I, I think I think it will do. I think it'll do a reasonably good job of of kind of letting us know the various kinds of gameplay mechanics that we're going to be encountering, and you know just how the game is going to sort of feel and, and how it's going to feel to play with other people. Obviously, you know we're only getting a look at uh, at three locations right now, but uh, I'm I'm very excited to check it out. I'm gonna I'm gonna try it on PS4 and on PC and kind of see. You know how well I can run it. The differences, yeah, on on each system. Uh, it was interesting to kind of read about. You know, they have they have said finally that they are going to have dedicated service to the game, but they are not going to have. Or the, you know, this is on PC, but uh, they're not going to have a server browser. A server list. browser. Yep. <laughs> it's only going to be like skill based matchmaking, and uh, I, I don't know, like like that. If if like that's going to be the case, then I'm kind of like, well, I'll just play it on PS4. I don't know. If there's really much of an advantage. Yeah, that or- really bothered me. That you know, I I, I I can understand why that bothers people. It doesn't bother me quite as much because I play Titanfall yeah. under those circumstances. And and I coming from Battlefield, I was like, are you are you kidding me? No no uh, server browser list. And it was really frustrating. And and at the end of the day, that that actually didn't frustrate me as much as the. The in, what frustrated me the most, and I guess the server browser speaks a little bit to this, is the the inability to customize the game types and maps. Well, yeah, and, and that's the. I mean, like, I I admit that it's not the exact same kind of game, and and really, like, like first person competitive stuff is not my forte. But playing DayZ and and all of the myriad variations, you know, on day like DayZ Commander or uh, not mm-hmm. uh, Day Zero, uh, using DayZ Commander, the server browser. Right yeah. to uh, to connect to various Daisy servers like that was where I really kind of woke up to oh this actually can be really really cool because you can sort of once you kind of figure out the thing that you like you can go and find you know servers that cater to that and find people on those servers that absolutely play regularly. you play the game modes you want to play right. I, like there there was a Titan mode in Titanfall that I just absolutely hated yeah and I couldn't stay away from it but on the other on the other hand like I get that well, I get what EA has said about it which is 
we want to encourage people to play all of the various game modes and to and, and to not just sort of like lock themselves into two maps right team death you know, match. 40 you know <laughs> right, 40 yeah, player yeah. battles on two maps and that's all they ever play a battlefront I, I understand I, I, that too, I just, but, but to me, the thing to do is to incentivize it, not to do it through restriction. Right, make people want to play it. I think players do try everything, and if you, I mean, players gravitate gravitate towards what they want. And I and, and I used to get really frustrated having to sit through a Titan match in Titanfall. It used to drive me nuts. But uh, you know, Brent, one other thing that I want to throw out there is that during the um, the Star Wars Battlefront beta, they're also going to let give people access to the Star Wars Battlefront companion experience which they said includes a strategic card game base command and lets you earn in-game credits that unlock star cards, weapons, and more in the game itself. Plus, you can also use it to check stats and progression and stuff. And I'm actually really interested to see that. I mean, if they... Again, this goes back to Gwent. Now, because of Gwent, I'm now interested in this concept. And if, if they I'm sure that, looked I'm at sure Gwent EA and really... I'm sure aware of that also. Uh, I'm sure if they really put some time into it, you know, I, I, I would love to see a... a I mean, I would love to see a card game associated with the game that would allow you to earn in-game, you know, rewards for it, and I'm intrigued. I would like to see a concept album that never got released by Lionel Richie that was a heavy uh, dubstep album called Bass Command. <laughs> since, we're just, since we're just announcing wishes out loud, that's what I want. Uh, I actually want that now. Welcome back, everybody. We are here in the clubhouse. Pull up a chair, and we're going to talk a little bit about this week's topic. But, of course, before we do that, we're going to go back to last week's topic and revisit the poll results from that discussion. Lauren. Hold, hold on. Hold on. Hold on, Brett. I'm on the other line right now. Okay. I'm, 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 talking, I, I'm, I'm talking to Los Angeles. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get through to Lionel Richie's agent. <laughs> Let me know when it I'm happens. trying to. I'm trying. I'm trying to work this out. I'm trying to work. I'm, I'm trying to work <laughs> I've got this a out. Deal. I'm trying to make. Th- here. This is going to happen. All right. Uh, uh, <laughs> last week's poll, we were talking about the failure spectrum yeah. in the Phantom Pain and uh, different ways, obviously, to deal with uh, a fail state uh, that isn't just simply a death mechanic. Uh, and we asked the listeners what they thought of the Phantom Pain's failure spectrum, and here's how it shook out, Brent. Coming in in fourth place with 9% of the vote, it's, they said that the failure spectrum in Phantom Pain nerfs the game too much for me. Coming in in third place with 16% of the vote, our listeners said that they love it. They wish more games would find a way to incorporate similar mechanics. In second place with just 18% of the vote, the listeners thought it's just a dumbed-down mechanic to make the game mainstream-friendly. And with an overwhelming 57% of the vote... The listeners answered, it's great in the Phantom Pain, but I don't think every game calls for it. So, uh, essentially, again, our listeners are wrong. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. It usually goes the other way. <laughs> I'm ragging. On. I, I have now, I haven't even played the game since I started playing it, but I have this desire now to rag on the Phantom Pain because we get like 50 posts a day about its awesomeness. So, just to be sort of... Contrary. Contrary. The word you're looking no, for I'm, is contrary. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right, Brent. So that's the poll for this week. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the topic of the week? Uh, the topic of the week is mobile gaming is dead. Let's all celebrate. Uh, well, not officially anyway, but if reports are to be believed from Yahoo's mobile analytics company, Flurry, mobile gaming has certainly taken a hit. And there's an article on Gama Sutra that we are linking to, which details the fact that according to Flurry, who has also sourced data from third-party sources like Comscore, in the United States, the average time spent per day playing mobile games on mobile devices has dropped 30% in the last year, which is a pretty sizable chunk of time. That is a large percent. Um, It's gone from the time spent (laughs) playing mobile games was 52 minutes per day. That has now dropped to 33 minutes per day. There are three primary reasons that they speculate might be the cause for this. Number one, not enough exciting mobile games or new mobile games, which I think we can lay squarely at the feet of CD Projekt Red for not coming out with that fucking Gwent game. (laughs) Uh, A preponderance of games with in-app purchases that allow players to advance and spend less time grinding. And then uh, the broader trend of eSports and people watching people play games as opposed to actually playing games themselves, spectating, Twitch, that kind of stuff. Which is interesting. i got to say, I'm surprised to see that in the list of reasons. Well, okay, but now here's, here's the thing. Um, they, they, they base that on the fact, here, here's, here's, here's what they base that on. 
And there's there's a very handy graph supplied at the bottom of this article. Uh, the time spent gaming is down 30, 33% or uh, 30%. But uh, the time watching entertainment, including things like YouTube, is up 240%. The time doing things like social media and messaging is up 50%. So people are actually on their phones more than they were during the same period of time last year, quarter quarter two, but they are on their phones more, but still spending less time gaming. So it, it's, it's an interesting thing. I, it's it's an interesting statistic. They list some interesting reasons, and you know, as far as their speculation about why it might be occurring, I would like to suggest another possibility, and that is, I think people are just they they've gotten bored, basically. Yeah, basically they've gotten bored with what mobile games are, and so all of those people who I think might have been more casual players anyway, they did it for a while, but now it's it, it's it's not something that that they're spending their time doing as opposed to your core gaming audience where gaming is a priority for them and they're going to spend time gaming no matter what. Well, and certainly the entertainment services are ramping up uh, their, their services. YouTube gaming, of course, is an example of that, but things like Showtime being able to be purchased a la carte now, HBO. Hulu being able to be purchased, HBO, yeah. Hulu being able to be purchased without, um, uh, without commercials. I mean, you know, the entertainment avenues that are available are, are certainly growing exponentially. In addition, Brent, I'd be curious to see this statistic broken into gamers and non-gamers. Yeah, right? and, and how do you um, draw that line? I mean, because, you know, like, depending on what point you want to make, I mean, people will very gladly shove, you know, non-gamers, people who, like casual gamers, we're describing them, they'll gladly shove them into that gamer demographic if it suits their purpose. Right, right. And, and I mean something, and, and this I'm just making an, you know, an arbitrary distinction right now, but it's kind of like the Wii, right? Like, I'm curious. Yeah. I would be curious to know actually what percentage of people that play. That's it right, that's it right there. I, I I think the Wii is actually a very good analogy for this. Well, what, so what percentage of people that play mobile games were people that don't own any other gaming device? Right. And of those people that don't own any other gaming device or any other mobile gaming, like any other a console or a PC or whatever, uh, of those uh, of those people, how many of those people have dropped? How significantly has their number, their game playing time dropped off versus people that do own? say, console games. And I have to wonder if, you know, one of the reasons that mobile gaming has been so huge histor- over the last six or seven years, you know, the... the, the um, because it the was shiny the iPhone new. store, Right, the iPhone store didn't even launch until, I think it was the end of 2008 or 2009. So it's only been six, maybe seven years tops. And so um, uh, I, I wonder, like, people who didn't game now had easy games that were very accessible because there was no barrier to entry like a controller. Yeah which required one finger to do Angry Birds or to do... And so people that would never game were excited by their new little toy. And now they're kind of bored with it and, and moving on. Whereas people that actually, you know, might have game like, played deeper game, like even something like Fallout Shelter, um, I, I don't think is a game that would that my, you know, 80-year-old or 70-year-old mother would play yeah. if she was still around. But, but, but Angry Birds certainly is or cut the rope. You know what I mean? I think you're right. I, like, Fallout Shelter is an interesting example because I was visiting... But meanwhile, Fallout Shelter's got millions of sales. Right. I, I, was, uh, I was visiting family recently, and my, my nephew, who's seven years old, was wanting to play some games on my iPad. And I said, well, sure, if you can find something that you want to play, go ahead. And so he tried a little Laura Croft Go, didn't really care for it. He tried a little Fallout Shelter didn't really get into it and finally he downloads Fruit Ninja and and plays that you know so how, how old was he again he's 7 7 yeah yeah so, yeah so i mean i wonder if those numbers are dropping off because the people that maybe didn't historically play a lot of games are, are uh, you know if they, I, i'm just curious i'd be curious to see no, that that i that, think that's it exactly it, 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 it's the nintendo wii like that is the analogy it's it was something shiny and new and, and different in the same way that the wii and motion controls were and everybody got into it, but of course, because there are so many other reasons that you would want to own a smartphone, it's one of the like it's not the it's not even the barrier to entry of oh I'll go buy this game console. The barrier to entry was oh I'll download this app from you know the Google Play Store, the the App Store, whatever. But then everybody kind of did that, and they were like, okay, yep, yeah, I've I've played mobile games on my phone now, and you know it's just. It's just the luster has kind of worn a little bit, and so everybody's all those. Well, there's, there's players, also less free. 
Moving on. Right? There's less free games than there were at the beginning. I think the original Angry Birds was probably free. I don't know if that's true. I, I, don't, I, would, I don't know. I would be curious to... I'd be so curious it's, it's to interesting. If you look at this article, they talk about... Well, the, certainly you know, there's more free to play. There's certainly there's more in-app purchases. Because right, right. in-app purchases is a recent development. Right. Hey, can we blend this on in-app purchases? I mean, there's a correlation, right? A hundred percent. So if um, there's a correlation, then it must be causation too. You know, it's interesting. If you look at the, the article, it says that, you know... The amount of time Americans spend using mobile devices, it just says Americans. It doesn't say the demographic. Yeah. But then you come down here and you, you get into the pl- part where they start talking about reasons, and it says, well, millennials are shifting from playing games to watching others play games, including a category called a new category of entertainment called esports, which is interesting because in America, I'm not sure how big esports is compared to, say, Let's Play videos. Yeah. I, I think people but probably I, I, watch. I think they're conflating those two. I, I think that I, I, I would agree with that. I think a lot more people are watching in, in America, now overseas. And, and it's growing, but I think probably more people watch Let's Plays than they do uh, esports, which you know can be identified obviously by looking at you know to start with PewDiePie. But um, but but he starts talking about millennials, and he starts talking about you know, and, and then again this like the same report claims the average of time Americans spend watching entertainment on their mobile device, and then in parentheses puts including YouTube, and thus presumably those esports watching millennials. Right, and that's yeah. that feels like a bit of a stretch to me. And I, I would just be curious to see those numbers broken down by demographic. But either way, I find it very interesting that mobile gaming is that's a significant drop year over year. Thirty percent is a big drop, as you said. I would like to know if anybody over in the Konami boardroom is reading this article and going, "Oh wait, wait just a second. because obviously you've got a lot of companies betting heavily on mobile games. Konami is just sort of like, you know, that's sort of the the target at the moment that I want to throw sharp things at. But I think that it is, it's it's interesting, given the fact that, you know, Konami has this whole strategy of we want to make mobile games because there's there's less risk and there's greater potential for, for profit and blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, well, that was true quarter two last year. Is it going to be true quarter two next year? And if, if these numbers, in fact, if this trend continues, if we continue to see a decline, maybe not at this rapid a rate, but if we continue to see a decline in mobile games, and I think that that is likely to happen unless there is some sort of significant innovation, like as an example, like the, uh, the whole, the whole uh, Taptic uh, 3D Touch engine that the new iPhone has, some equivalent on Android, where you know the screen can actually read how much pressure you're applying, and it can kind of give you, uh, you know, very precise feedback. You know, something kind of tactile feeling in the interface. Assuming that something like that doesn't completely reinvigorate mobile gaming, um, I th- I think that th- things staying as they are now will will continue to see a decline. And I wonder about how sound uh, Konami's current prospects would be. Vis a vis mobile games versus AAA games, if people are kind of walking away from the mobile game space because ah, we, we've kind of been there and done that. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I'd be curious to hear from the listeners, Brent, if they're actually playing uh, mobile games. I'd be curious to know if our audience, I mean, you know, I don't play hardly any at all. Yeah. Uh, you kind of go through fits and spurts where you find a game yeah. that you really get into. Exactly. It's, it's and you play the hell specific. out of it. Uh, mm-hmm. The way you would a console game, yeah. and then you don't play one for months. Like I don't think you're looking generally, like specifically, like I really like to have a a, a game to to be able to play, like when I'm on the line at the bank or I, I'm commuting somewhere. You just happen to find these games that you connect with and then play them like you would a console game. Exactly right. Yeah, I'd be curious to hear from our listeners, Brent, and see if they're playing mobile games. If the, what they see maybe is a trend in the industry, as I alluded to before, we have a number of developers that listen to the podcast. I'm curious if they are developing mobile apps or if they consider developing mobile apps and chose not to. Yeah. Uh, any and all of those things I'd like to hear you guys sound off on as usual in the comments. Okay, hey everybody, let's hit the road and talk about some of the games that we've been playing this week. I say some of the games. You know the games. It's Mad Max for Lauren. It's Phantom Pain for me. Lauren's going to go first. Yeah, so uh, have, I continue to have a great time with Mad Max, man. Um, I, I, I'm at 165 screenshots right now, which is That's uh, which, which is up there among my highest ever. It's just so goddamn beautiful. I continue to enjoy the game. I've got nothing new for you on the, on the content of the game, mm-hmm. uh, except... To say that 
without giving anything away, there, there's a point in the game, and I'm, I'm well into the game. I've got about 30 hours at this point. Um, there is a point in the game where it actually got spooky for a little while. Oh, cool. Um, and, and I can't, I can't share with you uh why yet without spoiling anything so but suffice it to say i've had some spooky moments driving around uh at night uh in, in or in the evening hours um sweet additionally um I, I i'm really hoping they put out additional content for this brand i'd love to see them do maybe some theme content but um i will say however that i i, I just started in the last say 48 hours having these pangs of wanting something a bit more story driven and uh I, I'm starting to think that I might be going back to The Witcher Three here pretty soon. Well, that would be uh, that'd be the direction to go in if story driven is what you want. Yes, indeed. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Just I mean, I could I could go on and tell tales of ribaldry and me driving around the uh, uh, the countryside uh, using my super awesome V8 die roller that I just I just absolutely freaking love. But uh, uh, yeah, so, it's, it's more of the same. Totally enjoying it. Uh, waiting for the next uh, game to pop up. So, I have continued uh, to play Metal Gear Solid Five: The Phantom Pain. A couple of notes on this. Yes. Number one. Last week you asked me how many hours I had in it. Yes. Uh, I went and checked the the day after we recorded the show. Uh huh. And you can check it within the game. Yeah. Yes, you can. Uh, yep. one, one of the or several listeners pointed out that you can go into the help menu the help menu lauren i don't know if you're aware of the help menu the help menu is the menu you get when you press on the left side of the touchpad i i don't think i'd ever gone into the help menu before you mean the one that allows you to restart the missions one that and allows so forth you to restart a checkpoint yes. or a mission yes uh, i'm familiar with it yeah i was um i was talking last week about how oh, there's no easy way to restart a checkpoint or a mission you and you subsequently found it like kill you <laughs> 20 and minutes literally later. the next day the day the show came out the day the show came out i was in the game and I hit the left, I hit like the left side of the touchpad for probably the first time. And I'm like, what the hell is this menu? Oh, like, well, I'm going to pay for that on Twitter. Oh, yeah, it didn't take long before, uh, <laughs> before our listeners pointed it out to you as well. So anyway, yeah, uh, once again, Hideo Kojima was right. I was wrong. Apologies to Yafit Koto. <laughs> so yes, I have found the fucking menu where you can restart the checkpoint. And I'm very happy about it because it makes things much easier and... The, the few times that I have decided that I want to restart a mission, I've done it. Although, since our discussion on the failure spectrum, I've not been quite as restart happy as normal. Like, I'm kind of just taking it all in due course. You're, you're allowing stuff to happen? Well, it's just the thing is, the game is so fucking big, like, I can't be restarted. It, it'll take you... I, I was wondering me, about that. It will take you... Year, like, it's going to take you forever anyway. Yeah, so... But if you I, try and, like... I, I can't even imagine if you tried to, like, zero... Or momentum. Ah. So anyway, but the point is that uh, at, during the same time where I had this discovery of being able to uh, restart the game, I also discovered that, you know, as, as the listeners uh, pointed me to, uh, in that same menu, uh, you can check and see how many hours you were playing. As of last week, the day after we recorded, I think I told you it was over 25 hours. I actually played 47 and a half oh hours my God. <laughs> as of last week. I'm sure that I added another 20 or so this week. Because wow. I played a lot this weekend. Um, Your daughter is still eating, right? Uh, my daughter's still eating. Well, yeah, that's the thing. Like, remarkably, I mean, I'll play a little bit while she's while she's in the room. But, but generally speaking, if she's up and awake, I'm playing with her. So, you know, typically this is taking place during off hours. You know, where she's napping or in bed or whatever. Um, I've got a couple of things that I want to talk about that have really been game changers, and that is. The fact that I've started unlocking more buddies. Obviously, you start the game with with uh, D horse, but uh, I, I I picked up D dog, you know, very very early in the game. That 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 first mission sequence, uh, right. I came across D dog and faulted him out. He was a tiny puppy at the tiny time. Tiny puppy. Well, he's yeah. a big old dog now. Yep, and he's going with me on missions and. Having a buddy with you on the mission that can actually work in support roles, as opposed to D-Horse, who essentially is just transportation. Right, so um, when you take D-Dog, you don't get to take D-Horse, right? That's correct. So you now have to run everywhere? Uh, or if you've, if, you've, if you've gotten vehicles, which I do, uh, once you upgrade your Fulton, uh, your cargo Fulton, to the point where you can extract uh, a vehicle? vehicles... You can start taking vehicles into missions with you, along so, with D Dog. Yeah, so like I'll, I'll right, right, drop in you, myself, okay. D Dog, and a Jeep. 
as an gotcha. example. And then, okay. you know, okay. D-Dog hops in the Jeep and we drive around. And so you can, you, I, and I only asked because, you know, the horse bothered me and it's, and so you can actually uh, eventually just get away from the horse entirely. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't used the horse almost all week. Right. Okay. Um, so, um, D-Dog is really, really interesting. D-Dog is trained to sniff out enemies, prisoners, mines, medicinal plants, things like that. So you take D-Dog with you. He's just walking along beside you the whole time. And as you are getting close to a, a guard outpost or an inst- a larger installation, he'll start to, to bark very softly. Kind of, and it'll say, D-Dog found an enemy. And a indicator will come up on your screen. And it'll be, it'll be kind of fuzzy and out of focus. Like it won't be the solid red triangle that you normally get. Right. And, but it, it'll just tell you, like, there's an enemy there. Then you'll need to either, you know, first person or scope in on them and actually lock them in w- on your scope, and then they will appear on the map. Uh, and he'll also let you know if there's medicinal plants nearby, if there's mines, and he can, he can detect uh, also wild animals if, you know, if you want to bring in right. a herd of sheep. There's wolves something. around or something. Yeah, uh, there are occasionally wolves. Uh, but anyway, so if you're sneaking into a large outpost, uh, you you can you can do maybe a little bit less of the strategic prep work because D Dog's going to let you know a long way off if uh, if there's anybody that you got to worry about. Now that's not to say that you still can't get yourself in trouble if you don't have an exit strategy, but it uh, it, it completely changes it completely changes the nature of of how you'll approach targets and things like that. Having D-Dog along makes for some really, really interesting switch up to the gameplay. The other thing is that he can, he can attack people. So if like, as an example, I I got myself into this spot where I I got like kind of out in the middle of this, uh, this stretch of uh, this stretch of land where there wasn't anything to hide behind. And I'm just belly crawling. And, all of a sudden, these two guys that I thought were much, much further away were right on top of me. And so I'm trying to, I'm trying, like, I have no suppressor at this point. Like, I've, I've gone through enough trank rounds that I've got no suppressor left. And I'm trying to stay non-lethal, so I don't want to switch to the rifle. So I've got to take them down physically. And I'm, I, I feel like they're going to spot me, and I'm, I'm, it's gonna, I'm going to be too far away to get close enough to do it. So you can tell D-Dog, go get them. And I've got one of them in my sights. I tell D Dog, go get him. D Dog attacks one of them. I jump up. They're both surprised. So while D Dog is, you know, is, is biting one of them, and he's he is uh, he's not incapacitated, but he's occupied. And the other guy is reacting to that. And I run up and you know grab the other guy and chokehold him. So you can use him very strate- uh, strategically as well. You, you you can use him to get you out of jams, which is Does cool. He- I'm curious, Brent. Does he does he ever get you in trouble? Like, uh, will he, he ever go out go after a guard without your direction? Or no, he he hasn't yet, but uh, he will. He will like the guards will react to him, which actually can uh, and you can also have him bark, which would be like an alternative to you knocking, as an example. So you could you send him around to the other side of a camp and have him bark, or do you like leave him there and you go to the other side of the camp and then it's th- th- there are things that you can do that I haven't experimented with. Like one of the last things I did with him. I unlock something like the more missions you go on with D dog, the higher your bond score with D dog becomes mm-hmm. and you will unlock additional things. And I just unlocked a thing where oh, you can, you can like, uh, you can tell him to like, like you can, you can direct him to a spot and tell him to wait or something like that. Right. But one thing, just, just to give you an example, uh, I was doing this, this one infiltration. It was like a really big compound and I was, I mean, like like twenty guards or something like that. And what I was doing is I was kind of around the perimeter, and I was I was picking them off, like like the perimeter guards. And then I was trying to lure people away from their normal patrol routes, and uh, and and then you know pick them off, you know, just like one at a time. And what'll what'll happen is I'll get somebody's attention, and then I'll kind of like you know walk away, and then I'll knock again and lead them a little bit further away, that kind of stuff. And it's interesting, right. like D dogs just like running around. And they'll come around a corner and they'll be D dog and they'll, you know, they'll kind of, you know, start and they'll get the exclamation mark over their head and they're reacting to the dog and seeing the dog and then they'll be like, get out of here, go shoo, shoo, shoo. 
And that reaction, like where they're focused on D-Dog and they're telling me to get out of here, that's a perfect time to like run up behind him and grab him. So there's all kinds of like really interesting tactical things that happen when it's not just you out in the field. So I did a bunch of missions with D-Dog and that was really, really cool. Also, in the last few days, I unlocked Quiet and she's a buddy now and so she's going into the field as well. Quiet is like very, very different from D-Dog in sort of how she operates, but ends up accomplishing some of the, some similar kinds of things. Um, so Quiet can move very, very quickly, and she can get to places like up high that you, you don't have access to. So what you can do is, with Quiet as your buddy, let's say I'm on a prisoner extraction mission, and helicopter drops us. Now, Quiet doesn't ride in a Jeep. But, you know, maybe like where the helicopter sets down, it's, let's say, 500, 700 meters from where we're going. I'll drop in a Jeep, so I've got Transpo. I'll bring up the map, and I'll put the reticle over the outpost or wherever we're going for this prisoner extraction. And you can tell Quiet, there's a thing in the map that I didn't discover, actually, until I started using Quiet, you know, like normally when you bring up the iDroid and you're using the thumbstick to just like sort of move the target around, you can press the up and down button on it. Normally, like if you hit the X there, it's just going to drop a marker, but you can press the up and down button on the D pad and it'll do different functions. So you can like press to like get like the helicopter and it'll show you like, here's all the places the helicopter could go. And you say, okay, drop me in here or pick me up here. Well, same thing with quiet. You press the, uh, the up and down arrows on that and with your reticle centered on, you know, the little installation icon for that, that outpost or whatever. Right, you're telling her where you're going to be attacking. You're saying, go scout. Right. So she'll go ahead, and she will just basically encircle the compound. Like, she'll, she'll just, like, you know, do a circle around it, and things will start popping up in the map. Dumpster here. Toilet here. And then once she kind of gets a scout thing done... She'll settle down into a sniping position, and she'll start, she'll start tagging guards, and they start showing up on your map. Now she doesn't always get all of them. Like, like you know, so like if there if there's a guard like you know somewhere she can't see them, then they don't show up. So it's not as it's not as accurate right. as as D Dog, who's you know like if there's a guard within like the range of his smell or whatever, right? He'll find them, but she actually tags them on the map as opposed to just sort of seeing them, you know, in, in the world and having to tag them yourself. Um, and the other thing is that she lends sniping support. So as, as I discovered kind of the hard way, I was, I was on this mission and it was like six guards and I needed to extract a prisoner, but two of these guards were like a plus level in a couple of their skill sets. So I wanted to extract them to, uh, to work on mother base. Well, I got a little bit. Uh, I got a little bit over eager. I went in a little bit sooner than I should have, and I get myself into a situation where all of a sudden, boom! Somebody sees me, and I go and I, I pop in with a trank gun, and it alerts three other people. And pretty soon, I've got like five of these guys, like all turning around, looking at me in uh, in reflex mode, and I go to like start tranking them, and all of a sudden, pop, pop, and like heads just start exploding. And uh, we're, we're quiet, taking them out. And uh, so the two A plus guys unfortunately got killed by quiet. So, but that, still, that sounds awesome. And I, I feel like I've read cool. a lot of people that aren't aren't loving quiet. I I think she's great. I mean, she like again, like it's a different kind of experience from D Dog, but it's very like it's very very cool. And if you do missions with quiet and increase your bond with her then you unlock new weapons that can be developed with her. And in this case, I managed to get a tranquilized sniper rifle. So now she'll just trank them non-lethally, and then I can extract the guys that I want. And then I've got to increase our bond level more. I think we're at 42 right now. And when I get to a, a bond with her of 80, I can have a suppressed trank sniper rifle developed. So Because right now, whenever she busts out, it alerts everybody They're like sniper and they get on the radio and start telling people. So it's a, uh, it, you know, it's, it's just, it's one of those, like, like there's, there's kind of a cool incentive for my play style to keep playing with her because when she's got that suppressed sniper rifle, right. Shit's going to get real. Right. 
That's dope, man. It sounds awesome. Dude, if- it's fucking cool. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing how much those two characters have sort of reinvigorated the game and like really changed it. As opposed to it being the same thing that I was playing, you know, 40 hours ago right now, right. it's substantially different. That's that's good game design. I agree. Um I've tried to get the mobile app working this week. I've been really, really curious about using the mobile app, using it to listen to tapes, and and, and to have like the map constantly in front of me on the phone. Uh-huh. Yeah. I have not been able to get it to work under any circumstances. I've tried, I, I've tried, you know, connecting the game online. I've tried exiting to the title screen, connecting online, like all these things people have suggested, but I have not once been able to get the the mobile app to. Uh, to connect with my PlayStation 4. And the only thing, and actually I just thought of this today when I stopped playing, my PlayStation 4 is not actually connected via Wi-Fi. It's connected to my router via Ethernet, and I don't know if that would make a difference or not. But anyway. Yeah, I don't know. Huh. But uh, I've really been wanting to try the mobile app, but just haven't been able to. So All right. Well, there you go. That's the Phantom Pain. That's awesome. Those are the two games for the week. Next week we might have some different stuff for you. I am looking forward to... Uh, as I said, maybe getting back into The Witcher 3 and then Episode 5. It's not going to be out yet, but Episode 5 is coming soon for Life is Strange, and I've got four episodes to catch up on. So There you go. Might have something new to talk about next week. Um, all right, Brent, as we head into the sunset, I think I- I'm going to go first. This, this, is a, this is a game I will not have next week, uh, <laughs> for sure. I'm linking to a story on Kotaku, and the title of the story reads, A Lego Dimensions Buyer's Guide for the Discerning Player. Now... Why am I talking about this? I'm talking, talking about this, about Brent, because this is um, <laughs> this is amazing to me. This is so Lego Dimensions is a game that comes out this week, I think. Yep. Um, uh, <laughs> it comes out this week, and uh, it is releasing with four hundred and sixty-five dollars worth of product. This is a Toys to Life game, a la Skylanders, right? Or Disney um, Infinity. The uh, the <laughs> The buy-in price, the lowest price you can pay to get this game in the starter kit is $99.99. Okay. So it's $100 to play this game. And I got to say, watching this game, Brent, it, it, it looks awesome. It's a mashup of like oh, yeah. a, a hundred different worlds that should not be together, including Scooby-Doo, Homer Simpson, Lord of the Rings, uh, Star Wars. What would you say? And Batman. And Batman and all these mashups, and it looks awesome. However... It's a hundred bucks to get in on the ground floor. You get, uh, I think, you get three characters uh, with the initial um, with the initial purchase. I think it's Batman and Gandalf, and then another character that I didn't know who she was. Um, and then they have packs after that. You could buy a level packs containing one character and two accessories from a single entertainment property. Each level pack unlocks a special themed game level for the property. Those are 30 bucks, yep. And then fun packs, which are one character and accessory. Uh, and you can use them to access free roaming adventure worlds on the properties they represent. Those are 15 bucks. Yep. And then team packs, which are basically two fun packs in one. Uh, two characters and two accessories from a given property. So like Scooby and Shaggy, for example, or whatever. Yep. Uh, $25. So, uh, Brent, I brought this in just just because I was I, I just was absolutely astounded. Oh, it's Wild Style. That's who the other one yeah, is. Batman, Gandalf, and Wild Style. And I don't know who Wild Style is, but well, she's from um, the Lego Movie. Oh yeah, that's right. Okay, um, dude, a hundred bucks to get in on the ground floor. See, I think you're looking at this all wrong, Lauren. I mean, as expensive as Legos are, you're basically buying Legos, and they're giving you the video game for fucking free. You're. <laughs> <laughs> they got they got you on the marketing, didn't they? Uh, you're not you're not buying Legos. You're buying like so again, a hundred bucks. You're getting those three characters and the little base thing that goes with it. So I love Lego, um, and I am very very excited about Lego Dimension. I am much. I find it much more appealing at the onset than Disney Infinity or Skylander. It's one of those things that Z is not old enough for yet, but I have great hope that. Lego Dimension will still be around when she is of that age, and it's something that we might be able to get into. Uh, the thing about it for me is that, yes, uh, it is expensive, but as opposed to those other two properties, the, the, the little toy that you're buying, along with your, your video game DLC, is a Lego. So yeah, you're paying a lot of money, but you have Lego to play with when it's all said and done. And there's no way that that can be a bad thing. I'm a huge, huge fan of Lego. I'm curious about Lego Dimension. I don't know that I'm going to buy the $100 pack or anything anytime soon, but it's something I've got my eye on. 
I'm just astounded. I'm looking at the like at the um the accessories that go with it. And like for there's a Portal Two one, for example, and you get you get uh uh a chell, I assume that is. Um and like a, a portal cube and one of the turrets with it. And that's and then the, it unlocks a level in the game. Right. Thirty bucks for that. Um it's just astounding to me. I just it's just absolutely astounding to me. Like if you wanted to play i mean most of these not all of them but a lot of these worlds are interesting portal 2 the simpsons back to the future jurassic world scooby-doo like you're talking about two three hundred dollars listen uh, this is one of those things that that you'll discover if you ever become a parent for yourself but the worst thing as a parent that you can experience is walking into a dark room and stepping on lego and so Really what you're buying here is the opportunity to have all of your Lego be virtual and to not step on it in the dark in the middle of the night. And you can't put a price tag on that, Lauren. You just can't. No, you're right. You can't. Oh, there's a Doctor Who one also with the TARDIS. There's Doctor Who. Oh, I'm getting it right now. With the TARDIS. Of course with the TARDIS. Of course with the goddamn TARDIS. <laughs> right, what else Brent. would it be? Uh, what do you got for me? It can't beat Lego Dimensions. No, it's not Lego Dimensions. Uh, I do have a very cool article over at the U.S. PlayStation blog. And it's a it's a write up from Ames Kirshen, the vice president of product development for Arkham and DC Comics games at Warner Brothers, and it's basically talking about how the 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 Batman mega franchise that that the Arkham series has become, how it all kind of came about, and you know like what sort of led to it, and the philosophy of the game, and honoring the canon, and all that kind of stuff. It's a cool article, just an interesting kind of look back. Um, over this uh, this game franchise that, like like really is uh, it, it's really really cool to to see this modern franchise and how popular it's become and how influential it's become in terms of its fight system and and kind of the sensibilities and things that have filtered to other games like Shadow of Mordor and all that. So anyway, go check it out. It's a, a fun read. Dopeness, man. I will absolutely check that out. I haven't read it yet, so I'll be curious to, to take a look at it. So, uh, all right, Brent. Then of course we have a ride along here. One of our uh, Outlaw Gamers joining us as we ride into the sunset. And this week it is a listener, Brave Indian. Okay. Brave Indian says, hey guys, love the show. Now that the busy season in gaming is here, I have an interesting question for you. Over the years, my gaming habits have drastically changed. I used to play one game to death and become really, really good at it. Mostly because I couldn't afford to play tons of games. So multiplayer games such as Call of Duty or Madden held much more value to me. Yeah. Now that I can afford to buy more games or rent them from Gamefly, I always want to experience everything. So I attempt to play all the biggest game releases while finding unknown gems when I can. In, <clears throat> in result, I tend to be less passionate about more games rather than more passionate about less games. He says, uh, I would be interested to hear what you think when you guys, uh, with you guys having a podcast, I'm sure it influences how you play new game that you play new games all the time. So here's the ultimate question. More games, less passion or more passion, less games. What do you think, Brent? Uh, I kind of go both ways on it. Uh, like a lot of things. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I've gone through periods where I have tried to just play every new thing that came along. And, and that certainly was influenced by this podcast specifically, you know, wanting to talk about what we're playing when we were doing the ax factor and, you know, certainly uh, that that inspired me to get games through Gamefly, get games through Redbox, and just try things. J- just you know, try things and sample things. And I went through several years of that, and I have to say that I did like I found it laborious. I, I found it, it, you know, it took it took effort. It was like work to track down games and to, you know to to get them on time and to play them and and feel like you had a, a little bit of experience and could talk knowledgeably about it. Uh, right now, owing to the fact that I don't have as much time to game, I do tend to be focused on one game at a time. I tend to focus on a game like The Witcher 3 or The Phantom Pain, play it, play it, play it, and then move on to the next thing. Uh, previously, Skyrim was sort of the game I was doing. So, right now, I'm definitely less games, more passion. But, I don't know, I mean, you know, like, as long as you're having fun, I mean, that's what counts. And, I mean, the thing is... I, I I miss some of the I miss some of the, the 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 rare gems I was able to play. I mean, I remember that year. I think it was the year before Z was born, and I just I played like all kinds of stuff. Uh, you know, just, just like like little things people suggest playing on Steam, and like oh, you know, you should check out this free to play game, and you know, go pick this up, and uh, you know, like I, I like that experimentation too. I, I I like being able to just go and just ah, you know, I'll just go you know play this run through this game in you know four to eight hours or whatever. So, 
As long as you're having yep. fun, that's all that counts. Yeah, a lot, and a lot of that for you came from uh, from Zeely, right? Yeah, from Zeely's birth, that changed the the nature of the way you play games. I'm sure parent, uh, when yeah. we eventually have a kid, that will do it. For me, I'm, I'm in a little bit oh, different boat than you. Because I? I didn't know we were trying. The, awesome, <laughs> well, I wasn't going to say anything on the show just yet, but since you brought it up, yeah. uh, we were going to save it for episode 50. We're but, um, having a baby. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I do get to play a little bit uh, more than you do right now because I don't have children, uh, but certainly you and I play games for the sake of the show uh, and have over the last five years of the show played games for the sake of the show, and it is a unique relationship to gaming in yes. that way. Um, and in my sp- case, I've finished games specifically for the show. Now, you wouldn't know anything <laughs> about that. One one game. You wouldn't know one anything game. about finishing a game for the sake of the show, but anyway. Uh, I finished The Last of Us, and that was one of the most painful <laughs> things I've ever done. Um, Touche. S- so, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it definitely... Um, you know, back before I did the show, I certainly played significantly less games, being a, a, a host of the show and when I was writing for the website. Uh, I certainly played a lot more games in order, in order to talk about them. And, you know, I don't know. I'm very, I agree with you, Brent. There's, there's pluses and minuses to both. I'm very grateful for the spectrum of games that I get to play, that otherwise, uh, per- previously, I would play a couple few games a year, uh, and I would play them passionately and be terribly into them. I still am, I still am that way uh, with many games. I mean... You know, it's funny that at this point, you know, the fact that I've put 45 hours into uh, a game like The Witcher doesn't seem like anything, right? Like, relative yeah. to the size of the content. But the fact is, is I put, you know, 45, 50 hours into that game. I put, you know, obviously hundreds of hours into games like The Golf Club. Um, I put, you know, 75, 80 hours into Skyrim. I mean, uh, I play, I, I've, mo- a lot of the games I've played through, you know, Shadow of Mordor, Stick of Truth, I've played quite a few games and so i do i I like being able to to know what's going on in the industry and to be able to talk about multiple different ips i really i really enjoy that i also really am appreciative when i connect deeply with a game the way i did with uh red dead redemption or journey or the way i did with uh arkham city or or even the witcher up to this point so i think there's value in both honestly uh that's my take on it anyway yeah it's just it's just different i mean that's the thing like i I don't know that i really put one over the other they're just it's just a different sort of experience. That That's exactly right. And yeah. as usual, we want to hear what you guys think in the audience about this topic. Do you think more more passion, less games, more games, less passion, or, uh, or, or a sprinkling of both? And likewise, everything we talked about in the rest of the show, whether it's Lego Dimensions, Rise of the Batman article that ben, Brent links to, Mad Max, Metal Gear Solid 5, Star Wars Battlefront Beta, Enterprise Virtual Tour, the new Hitman game being delayed, or our topic for the week, the report... From Gamma Sutra, uh, that U.S. average daily mobile gaming time has dropped 30% over the last year. We want to hear your thoughts I mean, on uh, <laughs> all of that and anything else in the world of gaming, as usual. He is Brent Adams. I am Lauren Baumgarten. And remember, you don't stop playing because you get old. You get old because you stop playing. <laughs>